Good evening. Well, I'll just uh, fire up. Uh, uh, you should be able to see uh, uh, this slide uh, here showing. This is the, the title of the symposium. Uh, and the, uh, uh, this is an abstract that uh, says uh, the, the, the main points of the idea is that uh, uh, in spite of overwhelming evidence on the payoffs to the investment public agricultural research funding has declined, especially in the high income countries. And, and there are plenty of reasons for being concerned about these trends. Uh, and so in this session, we're going to, to revisit and reassess the evidence on returns to agricultural R&D uh, in the context of the changing structure of changing uh, structure of global funding for R and D, we've got uh, three presentations uh, in the session based on recent research, and, and the idea is to spend fifteen minutes or so each on those presentations and leave time at the end for a for a general discussion of the issues. The the, the first presentation is by by Zhuang Rao from North Dakota State University uh, on. Uh, uh, providing an overview of the evidence on returns to agriculture R&D, uh, and that'll be followed by Phil Party uh, taking a, a, a big picture look at uh, the structure for agriculture and food R&D, uh, bringing, uh, and in particular, looking at uh, the funding for the CGIAR in that context, which will set the scene for, for me uh, to, to present our recent work on on uh, a meta assessment of the, the payoffs to, to research by the CGIAR. And with that, I'm going to hand over to, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over to Zhudong uh, and he can uh, take the floor. Thanks, Zhudong. All right, thank you, Julian. I have now to stop I'm sharing. Do I have to stop sharing? Uh, I'm taking over. Good man. Okay, can you see my uh, full screen? Good. Yep. All right, thanks. Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Shidong Rao from North Dakota State University. So the goal of, uh, it's my pleasure just to be the first to present in this session. The goal of my presentation is to first present a comprehensive database on the returns to agriculture R&D investment and then discuss the evidence we have collected from this rich literature. Okay, so uh, economists have long believed that investing in agricultural research can boost the uh, growth of agricultural productivity, thus generating a very high economic, uh, thus generating very high returns to, to investment. The, uh, are there any, is there any empirical evidence to support that? There is. So Zoe Grilich was the first one to empirically evaluate a research program, a hybrid corn research program, and he reported that the rate of return is as high as 35 to 40 percent per year. So his seminal work has inspired generations of researchers since him. Among them are researchers at the INSEP Center at the University of Minnesota, myself included. So at the INSEP Center, we have focused on various topics related with R&D evaluation and policy. One of our interests and also our contribution to the literature is to actively track the uh, literature on uh, R&D evaluations and compile a comprehensive database. That is the INSEP Returns to Research Database or RTR. Over time, we have been updating this database and to this current version, that is RTR version 3.5. The, uh, the most recent version include a targeted search of literature related to the uh, CG centers. So Julian, uh, Julian is going to spend more time talking about the, uh, that effort. So um, to construct such an extensive database, we have been using uh, the, uh, such a structure to construct the, uh, the information we have collected. We went out to different outlets for evaluation studies or publications. For each evaluation, evaluation study, the evaluators or the authors of the publications, they could focus on one R&D project or program or maybe multiple. Then for each R&D project or program, the evaluators can report certain rate of return measure or measures such as internal rate of return or IRR 
all the BCR that is the benefit cost ratio, or maybe a both or multiple measures. So a primary goal of this undertaking of this effort is to capture those rate of return estimates. However, we are also interested in how the evaluators, they derive those numbers. So while we were scoring these evaluation studies, we also capture information related with the, uh, the publications, the authors, such as the affiliation, the timing, the, uh, the time of the publication, where it was published, things like that. We also capture information related with these uh, R&D program or projects, such as the, uh, the focus commodity or commodities, the geographical locations, and also the, the duration, say the time, the time aspect. So if you're familiar with the meta analysis literature, so these two big boxes here, they are related with con the contextual factors. Finally, we are also interested in the uh, evaluation methodology each uh, evaluators have been using. So essentially, uh, we capture information about whether uh, the evaluators, they are using a production function or the uh, cost function or other kind of method to calculate the internal rate of return or what are the uh, assumptions that have been made. So these are the methodological uh, factors. So as you can see, this database is very com comprehensive and contains a lot of information. So using this consistent structure, we have been able to update the RTR database to the current version, that is the uh, version 3.5. In this database, we have captured 516 evaluation studies spanning about six decades. So ever since the uh, seminal study by Zui Gridix. And this database covers a wide variety of geographical regions and commodities. So as you, as you saw from the previous slide, this database contains many dimensions. Two of the most important dimensions are the geographical regions and the commodity focus of the R&D um, uh, project the program. Then for the, uh, the rental return evaluations, we, uh, we have been able to capture almost 3,000 rental return evaluations, including both the IRR, the BCR, or perhaps both. Since the, uh, the, the goal of the uh, today's session is about the rental return evidence, so just take a first uh, closer look at the, uh, the evidence. Out of these uh, nearly 3,000 evaluations, we have more than 90% of the evaluations reporting an IR estimate. Okay, so the IR is the predominant measure. Second to that is the benefit cost ratios. We have about more than 900 benefit cost ratios. So it's about a, the, a little bit less than one third of the total evidence. Between this, we have the, uh, a subset of evaluations reporting the, the uh, both measures. Okay, the reason I emphasize this is because we're going to make use of this, this overlap here, the, uh, because this overlap, this subset of evaluations that reporting both measures will allow us to uh, re-examine this whole evidence, okay? So now let's just look at the uh, two measures individually, okay? First is the uh, most popular measure, the internal rate of return. And here, this graph shows you the distribution of the reported numbers. So horizontally, we have the internal rate of returns the, uh, in percentage. So uh, you see, compared to the uh, typical or average investment opportunities, the uh, IRs for agricultural R&D investment are quite, in general, quite profitable. The, uh, they usually come in double digits. Then the next thing catch your eye, catches your eye is probably uh, to the right, we have a uh, high spike. Well, that means we have quite a few number of the uh, reported IRs greater than 100%, 100%. And the highest one is 5,645% per year, okay? And at the, at the other end of the distribution, we have, we have some uh, negative uh, reported internal rental returns. That means 
while the agricultural R and D are not always profitable. There are some ones, the uh, there are some ones with very uh, little, very few returns. Some could be a completely a failure. Like the negative one hundred means an investment barely generate any returns. So, given the highly skewed distribution of IRs, we should not be surprised to see that there is a big difference between the median and the mean value. And the median value is probably more reliable given this, the, uh, the skewness. So the median is about the 37.6%. Uh, so this is uh, the IR, reported IRs. Then we switch to the, uh, the another measure that is a benefit cost ratio. And here we have a smaller sample. It's about one third of the total evidence we have gathered. And at the first sight, the distribution seems to be pretty similar to that of the IRs. First, we still have a long right tail with a maximum value of 1,070, and meaning if you put in $1 into R&D, agricultural R&D, you're going to have $1,000 back in the uh, present terms. And then on the lower end, we still have a few R&D uh, uh, projects reporting very low benefit cost ratios. And in between, we have the median, a median of about 10.8 and a mean value of 26.4. Okay, so remember here, the me median value is probably more reliable. It's in the uh, order of magnitude, it's in the order of about 10. Okay, the, remember the, uh, the value 10. Okay, so this is the evidence if we look at the two measures separately. How about the, uh, so far, the, uh, the two sets of evidence seems to be largely consistent. That is, in general, the returns are high with the, uh, a few really high ones to the uh, right end. Then the question is, if we put the, um, the, two, the evidence using the two measures together, is it still the same story? So now we're focusing on the uh, subset of evaluations that are reporting both in the IR and BCRs. Horizontally, we just the, uh, put the, uh, the, ranks, the rank of the projects out of the 633 projects, okay? From left to right, we have the highest IR to the second highest, then to the lowest, okay? Vertically, we have the, uh, the difference in the ranking places using the two measures, the, uh, the BCR ranking places minus the IRR ranking places, because we want to, to compare the two, two measures, whether they will generate the same ranking. And the answer is no, it's not. So just take one as example. So looking at the, uh, this red spike here, for this particular project, if we use the IRR as the measure, it is ranked as the 182nd highest project among these uh, more than 600 projects. But if we use the BCR as a measure, it is ranked as, well, actually the lowest one, the lowest one. So now you see the difference, the huge difference between the two measures. It's about, well, uh, 400 that correspond to the vertical axis. There are even bigger differences for other projects. So I think the message here is pretty clear. The two measures, the IR and the BCR, they do not generate consistent ranking among different projects. This has led us to think about which is the uh, more appropriate measure to uh, look at the uh, rental return uh, literature. So uh, researchers have been looking into this uh, issue for a long time. So uh, to put it in a simple way, the IR and the BCR, they can be converted to each other under certain situ uh, conditions. And the BCR and the MIR, they are mathematically equivalent. In particular, me and my co-authors at INSTEP, we examine the algebraic, uh, algebraic properties of these different measures. Uh, we argue that the BCR and the MIR have better qualities than uh, the IR, even though the IR has been favored by most evaluators since Zui Gritik. So we, um, in a series of research, we developed this recalibration algorithm that allow us to recast the reported IRs into BCRs or MIRs. 
And the key is to use the, the subset of evaluations that report both a BCR and IR. Then the, uh, we are uh, not the, uh, satisfied with that because we are still foregoing a large chunk of this evidence. So in another study published last year, we developed a three-step procedure that allows us to impute many more uh, reported IRs into BCRs and MRs so that we don't have to give up a large chunk of this literature. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the technical details and how we do the actual the recalibration and the imputation. So what I'm just showing you here is just what we get. Okay, so here are the imputed BCRs. And we were able to impute, to derive a total number of 2,242 BCRs. Still not the entire literature, but it's, the, um, it's the, uh, more than 80%. And at the same time, we have to assume a 5% as a discount rate and assuming a 30 year project timeline. And this is, this is important because the, um, in the reported BCRs, the authors that have been using different discount rates. And it's not appropriate to compare the reported BCRs using uh, different discount rates. And also the 30 year project timeline is critical for uh, converting to your MIR, which is, the, which is going to be shown on the next slide. So first looking at the imputed BCRs, once again, we are, going to, we are having a, a skewed distribution the, on the right end, we still have a very high, well, we still have a large number of the uh, large BCRs with a maximum value of 3,549, okay? And on the left, we have still have the, uh, the few unprofitable ones. In between, we have a median of 8.0 and the median is 28.9. If you still remember the uh, reported BCRs, the, uh, there were some differences, okay? But once again, this is using our imputation algorithm, and this is by Im imposing a consistent assumption so that our imputed BCRs, they are directly comparable. So this is the uh, evidence from imputed BCRs. Next slide is our imputed MRs. So the MRRs, uh, the MRR and the BCR, they are mathematically equivalent. So will the MRR evidence the same as the BCR? Well, here's a distribution of the MRR and the, uh, well, the sample size for the MRRs is the same as that for the BCRs. And MRR is reported in the percentage form. So we can see that still, most of the uh, imputed MRRs come in the uh, double digit. And the uh, mean value is, well, here we don't have a, uh, a distribution that is skewed to either side. The maximum value is much smaller than that for IR. So now it's 37.8. The minimum is still an abysmal, uh, abysmal value of negative 100. But the mean value and the median are much closer. Okay, so this is the imputed IR, uh, MRRs. Sorry, there is a typo here, it should be MRRs. If we compare that with the reported IRs, we can see the drastic differences between the, uh, the evidence reported using the two different measures. Okay, so this is for the imputed MRRs. So to wrap up, we, uh, we compiled a very comprehensive database from the R&D evaluation literature. We, uh, if we take the face value of the reported rental return measures, we see very high numbers. So on average, the R agricultural R&D investment are able to generate very high returns with a median internal rental return of 37 or 38%. The median benefit cost ratio is greater than 10. But if we are a little bit critical of the literature and interrogate the underlying assumptions of the measures, uh, we, trans we uh, reinterpret the literature using more consistent assumptions. We are able to derive an imputed BCRs and MRRs. The imputed evidence is, well, still suggests very high rental returns with the median MIR about 12.5% 
a median BCR of eight. And the, uh, we believe this imputed evidence is more plausible. And the, uh, our criterion for plausible is not about the values themselves, but it's about the underlying assumption, the assumptions underlying the, those measures. So the, uh, this is the, uh, the main points of my presentation today. And here are some of the work that have been done by researchers at INSTEP Center. And I will be very happy to answer any question. Uh, thanks, uh, Zhidong. Uh, and uh, much as it might be fun to have questions now, I think in the situation, uh, thanks also for being so uh, good with time. Uh, I think given the way we have to operate it, might be hazardous to start having questions and answers now. So I think what we will do instead is just run through the three presentations then and then uh, have a, a general uh, discussion. Uh, as more people turn up, we've now got uh, 10 uh, participants. So uh, uh, let's carry on. Phil, uh, would you please take over now? Sure. Thanks, uh, Julian, and uh, uh, welcome to everyone uh, online. And uh, I'm amazed, Julian, you managed to scuttle over to the Corfu coast overnight. Uh, I was speaking to you in California yesterday, so it's just a, a, a miracle of mod modern travel uh, capabilities. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the session's about this uh, incongruity between the evidence uh, uh, and the reality of the funding that uh, uh, is supposedly being uh, motivated and supported by that evidence. Um, so we've been chipping away myself personally for uh, most of my career trying to get a, an empirical handle on uh, uh, the spending on uh, uh, agri-food research worldwide. Uh, very difficult numbers to generate, um, but we have done our best to adhere to uh, uh, OECD and NSF standards in putting these data together. So this is our, our latest incarnation of, uh, of these data. Um, so for, if well, this isn't progressing here. Okay, so I just thought it, as a bit of context um, uh, in terms of uh, the R&D data, I thought I'd open here with uh, where in the world uh, uh, is uh, agriculture performed and uh, how has that changed over time uh, uh, so that we can juxtapose that uh, relative to the R&D evidence. So what we've done here is taken the FAO 186 commodities and valued them up with a uh, a baseline uh, international EBP value. And we see over the period 61 to 2019, a, a um, threefold increase in real terms in the total value of uh, agricultural production. Uh, so we've gone from about just over 1 trillion to, to nearly $4 trillion. Uh, uh, Where in the world that takes place uh, uh, is uh, quite dramatic in terms of the changes over that period of time. So. Back in the day, around 44% of that uh, value was generated uh, collectively by the high income countries. Uh, that's now down to less than a quarter of uh, global production. The flip side is that the Asia Pacific region has gone from around 14% to around 44.5% of the total. So a huge shift over this uh, 60 odd year period in terms of the location of production. Uh, China alone now uh, producing over a fifth of the total value of agricultural output in the world, uh, more than the US and, uh, and Europe combined in terms of its agricultural output, uh, which was not the case uh, uh, decades ago. If we switch over to where in the world does agri-food R&D occur, these are comparably new data we've put together that are including both uh, private and public uh, food and ag R&D. Uh, unfortunately, our, our private data don't stretch back uh, to 1960 like our public data. So these are running from 1980 to 2015. Uh, we had a, over that period of time, we had a 2.2 fold increase in the real value of ag output. Uh, we've had a three fold increase uh, in, the, in the real investments in uh, food and ag R&D. So around 30 billion in 1980 to 92 billion uh, uh, in 2015. But once again, a huge shift in the geography of uh, where that takes place. So we had around 70% of the world's food and ag R&D, public and private uh, in 1980 in the rich countries, uh, now down to less than 50%. Uh, the Asia Pacific region has gone from just under 9% to 36%. Uh, the US has lost significant 
global share of public and private food and ag R&D uh, over this period of time, from over a fifth down to, to less than 15%. China's gone from about 1% and to our estimates to over a quarter uh, of total investments in public and private food and ag R&D worldwide. Uh, these regional trends are quite dramatic and show the sort of the, the, the timing of the shift with respect to public ag R&D, which as I mentioned, we have that data back to 1960. Uh, if you group uh, the middle income countries, Brazil, India and China together, you can see in 2015, they're collectively accounting for around $13.1 billion worth of public R&D spending. Uh, that's around three times the spend of the US uh, and uh, almost double the spend of uh, Western Europe. So a dramatic shift with respect to that landscape of public ag R&D relative to 1960. Uh, the, uh, the big, the Brazil, India, China triplet, uh, uh, surpassing uh, the US uh, spend uh, uh, back uh, in the, the late 1990s uh, and surpassing the Western European spend uh, collective uh, in the mid 2000s. Uh, behind these trends are significant differences in uh, the rate of growth over time. So here the bars are indicating the, the pre-1990 and the post-1990 annual average rates of growth. You can see there's a general slowing uh, of uh, growth uh, pre and post-1990, an exception to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and that is driven by some exceptional growth uh, in uh, two large spend countries, Nigeria and South Africa. Uh, in fact, two thirds of the countries in South in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, were growing slower after 1990 than they were prior to it. What I want to draw your attention to here is the sort of dramatic disconnect between uh, uh, the rich countries and, and the rest of the world with respect to the, the pace of growth in uh, their ag, public ag R&B spend. So a slowing across the board, uh, very dramatic, uh, uh, not just in the US uh, and Europe, but across in the other high income countries in terms of rates of growth of uh, food and ag R&D spending. Uh, this is leading to a large and growing uh, global divide uh, in terms of uh, where in the world this uh, public ag r and uh, uh, is taking place. So we can see uh, back in 1960, uh, as a was evident from the earlier slide the, the rich countries were, were uh, well over half of the total spend. Uh, they're collectively down to 45%. Uh, if you bundle all the, the middle income countries together, a dramatic increase in their, their global share and just point you to the low income countries uh, where a lot of the, the productivity uh, uh, growth needs to take place to, to feed very substantial rapid growth in population. Uh, and for other reasons, uh, over this period of time, a reduction in their global share of a third uh, in terms of the total public spend. Uh, a dramatic shift, so we have dramatic shifts in the geography of uh, investment, dramatic shifts in who's conducting the R&D. Uh, so our data is uh, collected on a by performer basis. So it's not in terms of where the money comes from, uh, but in, term, in terms of who performs it. So when we talk about public research, this is publicly performed research and privately performed research. Uh, and from 1980 to 2015, just a really dramatic shift in that. So we've gone from a, a global system that was effectively two thirds public, one third private, to a system that's now roughly 50-50 with the private sector now starting to edge out to the public sector globally. And huge ramifications in terms of uh, you know, why that's come about, but the implications of that spend, maybe we can talk about some of that in the, the Q&A. Um, so this private sector presence uh, is uh, rising across the globe, uh, not in a, a consistent fashion, but, but a significant rise in the private presence. Uh, and so this is giving an indication uh, in 1980 versus 2015 of what the private share of the respective regional public and private totals are. Uh, and you can see in, in all cases, uh, uh, a growth in that private share uh, in 2015 vis-a-vis -vis 1918. Uh, just drawing attention to China and the US uh, by our estimates uh, are now, uh, as I say, heavily uh, oriented towards private performance of the uh, ag r and in those two countries. And in fact, now that the, the uh, 
the public-private uh, uh, performance is no longer exceptional for the food and egg sector vis-a-vis -vis the rest of R&D in those countries. It's basically uh, over this period of time, uh, food and egg R&D looks like the rest of the, 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 the R&D uh, uh, spend in terms of its public-private orientation in those two countries. Uh, uh, there's a high, always been a high concentration in, in by country in terms of who conducts this research. Uh, again, this is uh, public and private research comparing 1980 to 2015. Uh, but you can see a significant reshuffling in the, the rank order uh, of who's uh, of the top 10 countries there from uh, then versus now. I'll just draw your attention to this, these sort of geographical concentration uh, figures. Uh, so we're now at a point where uh, the top 10 countries alone uh, are zeroing in on nearly three quarters of the total public and private food and ag R&D spend of the planet. Uh, the top 20 countries, nearly 86%. But as I mentioned, that's a, that's a, a continuation of a, of a reality that occurred, uh, has been uh, persistent for some decades. Um, you can see now that China, India and Brazil are now firmly embedded and have uh, uh, in, in the upper parts of the, the, the rank order of the total R&D spend worldwide for food and ag research. Uh, here's a, uh, an array of uh, 136, I think it is, countries uh, in terms of their intensity uh, of public and private spend vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the value of ag production. Uh, globally, uh, in 2015, uh, the ag R&D intensity was 1.8%. Uh, relative to our estimates of uh, the global spend on all R&D, uh, ag is uh, uh, measurably more intensive in terms of its investment in uh, public and private uh, R&D than, uh, than R&D in general. Uh, there's a gen uh, of array countries here in terms of their gross national income from uh, left to highest to right to lowest. And you can see a general tendency uh, in terms of uh, higher intensities uh, as uh, uh, per capita incomes increase, but not by, mo by no means a uniform uh, uh, tendency. So there's large country-to-country uh, uh, -country variation in these research intensities. And just pointing out a couple of uh, uh, important points here that uh, the US is by no means the most intensive investor in public and private food and ag R&D. And China still has a long ways to go uh, to get anywhere near the level of uh, intensity of investment of, of the US and, and other rich countries, recognising China is already in absolute terms, so not relative terms, uh, the largest uh, investor in food and ag R&D uh, in the planet. A uh, couple of slides to wrap up here. Uh, long run data that we've been chipping away at for some time with respect to the US. Uh, we have uh, richer data sets. Uh, uh, you can see a dramatic uh, shift in the public-private roles there and, and the pattern of that shift over time, uh, partly driven by an increase in uh, private sector spending, but, but not just a slowdown, but a retreat from investments by the public sector. And in fact, in the US now, in real terms, these, these are deflated with a, 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 a US-specific ag R&D deflator that we've developed, uh, uh, which increases uh, uh, more rapidly uh, than the uh, general uh, GDP deflator. Uh, the, uh, the level of real investment in uh, USDA and experiment stations now is about where it was in the mid-1970s. Uh, so a significant retreat in real terms and in investments here. And so you can see in the top left there, this the blue lines are the, the period average annual rates of growth. And uh, since the 1990s, we've been disinvesting from the public sector but we've been slowing down substantially the rates of growth of private sector investments. That is the red, red figures there. Uh, we've also got a significant shift, at least in the US, and we have anecdotal and uh, quasi quantitative uh, indications for other rich countries, at least of a, of a reorientation in terms of what re what's being done with that research. Uh, so this was a, a pretty painstaking effort to go through all of the in, all of the CRISP project files and extract projects that, that were oriented towards either promoting or uh, preserving uh, ag productivity growth, and our estimates are in the US that we've gone from uh, just a shade under two thirds to now under one half of the investments uh, in the public sector in the US have uh, 
uh, either promoting or preserving uh, ag productivity growth. And now a substantial share of states there, you can see the, the state count on the yep. vertical column uh, spending uh, uh, less than half of their total spend on uh, productivity oriented R&D. Uh, as an opener for Julian's uh, uh, presentation coming up, we've uh, uh, also compiled the, the total spend in real terms with respect to CG spending here. Uh, and you can see a dramatic reduction, uh, almost a third in real terms uh, over the 2014 to 2019 period uh, in spending on uh, CG research. Um, the uh, dashed line there indicates the total public and private spend of the low income countries, uh, uh, which has been uh, tracking uh, uh, fairly closely the total spend of the CGIR. Uh, but you can see in the, the inset there uh, who are the major funders of that uh, and they tend to still be, um, as they have always been, uh, rich countries or uh, in terms of rich country governments uh, uh, or rich country based foundations uh, account for uh, a very substantial share, uh, over 60% uh, for just the top 10 uh, investors alone of total lot of CG funding sources. So just bottom lines here, we see this rich country retreat from the public sector spending, uh, not just on their own domestic research, but you can see in the previous slide in terms of their commitments to international leg R&D. Uh, there's a rise in the Asia and Pacific share and a declining share of the spend amongst low-income countries, a massive decline in international leg R&D, a substantial decline of productivity-oriented R&D, at least in the rich countries, certainly in the US and, and uh, seemingly elsewhere, a substantial shift to private sector spending. And so this, over, over these, Decades represents an unprecedented structural shift in, in the geography, the research orientation, and the research performance of every food R&D. Just finish up, there's a clearly a new set of players investing in this space. Uh, the R&D spending, uh, there's a lot of venture capital funding uh, coming into the agri-food sector, ag funder reports about 26 billion bucks of uh, spending in 2020 of startup funding. Uh, but we need to be careful and not confuse venture capital spending with R&D spending. Uh, there's no unknown share of that startup funding is being spent on R&D. Uh, and we need to be careful about the distinction between investments and innovation, which involve, uh, and, and there are OECD, Oslo manuals that describe what that entails with respect to scientific, technological, organisational and commercial oriented spending, of which just the R&D component is a small part. Uh, so with that, I... Uh, Finish up and hand it over to Julian. That's wonderful. Thanks, Phil. Uh, that's uh, that is really impressive. I have to say, uh, it, it, I just feel uh, uh, that you know there's just so much here. It's a it's a pity we have so little time to, to go into it. But we do have a question uh, in the chat, which I think we'll just if people want to ask questions, I think we'll just uh, stick them in the chat and we'll come back to them later on. We have one from Eustace that I'd like to get back to, but it'll be better at the end. Uh, and so we'll just whip through my uh, presentation, see if I can be as, uh, as good as uh, uh, Phil and Zudong have been on time. Uh, uh, so I'm just, is that working? There we are. Okay. So uh, uh, yes, uh, this, uh, the, the title for my presentation is Payoffs to a Half Century of CGIR Research. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, Using the, the coming from Phil's kind of introduction with respect to the the, the decline in funding that that uh, uh, gave rise to some concern uh, generally and, and and in response to that uh, we were commissioned to to do a report uh, to do a study on uh, on what's been going on with uh, CGR research uh, funding and and the payoff to it and we, we published a report in October last year uh, this was. Uh, 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 Manage uh, and uh, through the the Soar Foundation, uh, supporters of agricultural research in Washington D.C., uh, uh, funded by Gates Foundation, and and, uh, uh, and we uh, at the end of this, I'll, I'll have some links where you can get to these things. They're readily available. Uh, coming from that report, we published a a short piece uh, uh, in uh, uh, issues in. Uh, Innovation and technology, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, and they'll be available too. And, and now we have this piece I'm presenting today, which is 
almost, I'd say, uh, boldly, almost accepted at the AJAE. So, so we have a full paper uh, with a lot of stuff on this, which uh, I'm going to try to do justice to, but will fail miserably, no doubt. So we were, our motivation was to, to, uh, to really address this question. There was a, a, the word on the street was that, that uh, CGIAR uh, or CG research had paid high dividends. The, 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 the rule of thumb was 17 to 1 benefit cost ratio based on a previous study by uh, Reitzer and uh, Kelly. And so we were asked to, to see if we could uh, uh, give a, a new up-to-date answer, a compelling answer that would be, uh, would clarify what has been the payoff, but also uh, what are the prospects. And so, uh, and there were questions about whether uh, it was all over in the sense that the easy gains have been made and what's been happening over time. Uh, and, and if you look on the right, uh, this is another one of Phil's creations, but uh, if you look, the, these are, high in blue, middle income in red, and uh, low income in yellow on the left-hand side axis. This is their uh, real spending on, on agriculture R&D. And you can see that the poorest countries in the world are, are barely showing up on, the, on this map. And then on the right-hand scale, you can see that low income countries plot against the CGIAR. So the, the two uh, uh, lines there, the yellow dash and the green one are showing spending, which is focused on uh, low income countries in particular. And what we see is this uh, is very low uh, relative to the rest of the world, to the high income countries and middle income countries, but also this precipitous decline in CGIAR. So the question is, uh, are the other countries going to cover that uh, expenditure, that, that uh, 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 research area or not? So, so that's the, the, the question. Um, and so we, we it was a backwards looking assessment of, of what's been, uh, what, what have the other studies shown? And so we, we gathered all the available evidence and you think back to, to Zhudong's presentation, this is essentially expanding his data set, if you will, or the INSEP data set, uh, the kinds of measures that Zhudong uh, was talking about for, for the broader subject to, to cover uh, research undertaken by the CGIAR and by uh, uh, national agricultural research systems in low and uh, 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 middle income countries. And as Zhudong described, to, to, to convert them into comparable, uh, to standardise them and convert them into comparable benefit cost ratios, and then, uh, and then do a formal uh, meta review of that, that evidence. And then we, we, we did a couple of other things as well to, to provide some uh, benchmarking, if you like, to say, uh, we did a, a, a we, we compared the, the evidence from uh, a selection of nine uh, big studies, uh, which uh, studies that had payoffs in excess of a billion, uh, and we also looked at the the value of TFP growth attributable R and D and said, do these uh, measures from these kinds of approaches do they uh, comport with what we're getting out of the, the meta assessment? So uh, these are uh, plots of the data. On the left is from the CG. Uh, and from the right, uh, the, the non-CG, this is for, for, for low and middle income countries. This is, so this is the, a summary of the data after so a lot of work done uh, to, to get these data into comparable terms. These are benefit cost ratios, imputed benefit cost ratios. Uh, we have 203 of those for the CG and 577 of those for the non-CG. Uh, and uh, you can see that in both cases, the distribution is heavily skewed to the right um, and uh, a long tail. Uh, and, and these uh, uh, differences in the findings uh, for, reflect differences among studies in their coverage in terms of crops, uh, research projects and programs, the geographic relevance of them, uh, the, when they were done, how large they were, uh, and also uh, the, the way the study was performed. and and uh, they could be real differences or they could be, uh, be uh, errors. Uh, so we have, and we have these different measures of central tendency and because of the skew, the, the mean is uh, uh, very big relative to the median. Uh, we think the median is probably a more sensible measure of central tendency, but it's not, uh, central tendency is only one idea with these very uh, diffuse distributions. But the, these are very similar to actually what Zudong referred to for the, for the bigger data set around uh, uh, 24 or 26 for the for the mean and around 8 to 10 for the for the median and, and he had 10.8 and 26.4 for the full data 
So, so we're, we're looking at these are the data we're going to use in, in the, the regression analysis. Uh, looking at them over time, you see in the early period we had some very big, uh, this is just for the CGIAR, these are 10 year moving averages uh, of these different measures. So one measure is the mean BCRs, that's the, the solid blue line which begins very high. There was a small number of early studies uh, of the, the Bonanza uh, Green Revolution uh, uh, projects and, uh, and they were very high and, and as uh, more and more studies were done, the, the, the moving average fell down to uh, more like uh, 15 or so, uh, and then it uh, rose up to more like 35 over the subsequent uh, uh, couple of decades or so. Uh, and and you can look at the number of publications, that's the, the, uh, the, the lowest uh, uh, red line, uh, and then we have the number of estimates. So many of these studies produce more than one estimate, so we have numbers of estimates and, and, and so on. And the median you can see follows the same kind of pattern as the, the mean, but it uh, is just lower. Okay. And, but as we see, uh, uh, apart from the early period where we, we, we drop down below the, uh, uh, the very high early estimates, uh, the, the trend has been, if anything, for, for a rise in, in, in both the, the median and the mean. Uh, so there's no evidence here uh, of a, a, a decline in the, the rate of return. To, to research by the CG. Uh, there's a lot of numbers here, I'm sorry about that. There's only one number really to remember, the number is 10, uh, but I'm gonna tell you a lot of other numbers uh, that support that number 10. Okay, so so here we have the kinds of details. So for the CG agriculture R&D, we had a total of 78 uh, studies, yielding 203 estimates. The mean was 26.3, standard deviation was nearly 40, so a very big range from 0 0.6 to 230. Uh, even if we chop off the top and bottom tail, there's a very big range. So 90% so, uh, uh, of the estimates were, were greater than 2.6. So greater than one means it paid for itself. So we got a, a fraction of them uh, were benefit cost ratio less than one, but nearly all were greater than one. Uh, and 10% uh, and, uh, 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 were above 68. Uh, and you can see also in the next line that a very big uh, majority of the total uh, studies and the total estimates were for crops and the pattern of the estimates for crops are just like the, the, the total thing. If you look down the left hand column, you can see that uh, in these studies only one for livestock, uh, a few for natural resources and a few for poly policy oriented research. Uh, almost all of them were for uh, related to developing countries. Uh, and we can fill in the table. Uh, and I just want to point out that across these different, uh, you can pass this out into different ways. We cut it down into to whether the, the commodity orientation and, and uh, the regional focus. But if you look across these different groupings and the, uh, the, the mean uh, is, is similar, uh, you can't tell them apart. Uh, uh, the, 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 another way to say this is to say that the the, the noise to, to signal ratio is, is pretty high. Uh, uh, and so we can't really say that there are statistically significant differences in, in the means among these different categories. Likewise, the, the medians, we can't really uh, tell them apart. Uh, we can do the same thing for the, uh, for the non-CGR research. And I'm just going to skip over that. The pattern is quite similar. Uh, and uh, I just have this summary comparison here to show that uh, as for the CGR, uh, a very high proportion of the total number of estimates is for, for crops uh, and uh, the means uh, uh, are similar between the CG uh, and non-CG estimates. Likewise, the medians, the, the means are a little bit lower for the non-CG estimates. It's a bigger sample and, uh, and so on. So um, let's go. Okay. So for the regression analysis, uh, not all for the regression analysis, we had uh, to compile a, a lot of uh, measures of covariates, a, a long list of covariates, uh, such as you know, characteristics of the studies, the, the geography, the methods of assessment used, and so on. Uh, a long list of those, uh, too many to show you all of them. And, uh, uh, and then we had to, uh, so we had the full data set, uh, which I've shown you there, uh, uh, broken down according to, to different CG centres. Uh, and uh, and we've 
characterise them as the founding four. That's the first four uh, uh, CG centres uh, that were the beginning in the in the early 70s. And then there's another five for which we have enough data to be able to, to measure uh, effects associated with particular centres uh, of the total of 15 centres. And we also have uh, some measures for policy oriented research. So these are the characteristics that uh, that's one classification we're looking at. Uh, and, uh, and then this is the full data set, which I've shown you before for the 203 uh, uh, for the CG and the 577 for the non-CG. But uh, we don't have details on the covariates for all of those uh, uh, observations. So the total number for the regression subsample is only 170 for the CG and 552 for the, for the non-CG. And, and uh, we, we end up with these, uh, I can show you lots of tables, but I, I shan't. Uh, and, and instead, we can look at this thing on the right, which uh, we show from the bottom going up. If we look at all the estimates, we've got a really tight distribution of the predicted, these are now the predicted uh, BCRs at the mean uh, of, the, of the sample data. And if we do that for all estimates, it's a very narrow uh, band. Uh, and for the non-CGR, it's a, quite a narrow band centered around 10 uh, 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 for the for the CG is a bit wider but it's still uh, uh, centered close to 10 a bit higher than 10 and then as we look to, to subsets uh, the the bands get wider uh, the measure of central tendency is still pretty much right around 10 to 15. okay so so the bottom line we get out of this if you look at the CG the, the predicted benefit cost ratios, 12 with a confidence interval that's pretty tight around that between, so we say between 10 and 15 for that one. And for the non-CG, it's, it's a bit lower, but uh, it's a tighter confidence band. And if we think about the 60 billion spent on the CG over its 50 year or so life, a 10 to one benefit cost ratio implies a 600 billion return. So moving on quickly to the ground truthing. Uh, so we, we, other meta studies have, have uh, have been more selective in their approach. We were quite comprehensive and included every study we could in that assessment. And now another approach is to, to look through and say, well, let's just look at the big studies. Uh, and, and one reason for that is that the benefit cost ratios are given equal weight in that previous assessment, regardless of the scale of the investment or, or how credible the estimates are. This approach is more selective in the sense that you pick out studies and you say, do we buy this evidence? Uh, you could say that or uh, is it interesting evidence because it's a, it's a big number. So these were these selected nine studies we found where we could uh, at some level verify and replicate uh, the analysis and, and, and come up with measures that we could project forward. And so these are these nine studies that, that together uh, we, we get the present value of benefits for the period that they reported is uh, one point uh, <laughs> Uh, 28 trillion, 1,280 billion. Uh, and then if we project it forward to 2020, uh, the total is 1.78 trillion. So this is a lot of money. Uh, okay. And this is just for these nine studies. You say that's a lot of money, but we think about these are studies referring to, to, to staple uh, crops uh, for the planet. These are, these are the big scale uh, uh, industries and, and productivity growth in these industries has been large. And so there's potential uh, for this to be plausible. Uh, so what we did was take those estimates. So if, we, uh, if you look in the, the bottom line of this table, look in the top line of uh, the current table. So we've got 1.78 uh, trillion. Uh, if we give 100% of the benefits to uh, the CG, then that's uh, 1.78 trillion. If we cut it in half and say, well, maybe maybe if that's all attributable to, to R&D, but maybe only half of it's attributable to, to research. And, and uh, so that's 891 uh, uh, billion. And if we say, well, maybe half of that again is attributable to the uh, National Agricultural Research Systems and the CG, uh, uh, so that's uh, 446 billion. So you say that's, this is crude attribution. That's what's done in these studies is, is people measure the benefits and, and do some attribution of that nature. And so we compare these measures of benefits attributable to those innovations 
uh, with or productivity growth in some cases with the, the cost, various kinds of costs. So one measure of cost is the, the first number we have here is 44.5 billion. That's the, the, the present value of costs for the centres in the evaluations so in those nine studies. And if we compare that with the 100% uh, uh, attribution of benefits, that's a 40 to 1 benefit cost ratio. Uh, if we do a 50% attribution, it's 20 to 1. If we go down to 25% attribution, that's 10 to 1. So there's our 10 to 1. That's that's the most plausible number to take out of this table. Uh, if we want to be more conservative and say, well, we're going to charge the cost of all the CG against uh, those benefits, we, we push that benefit cost ratio down to 7.5. Uh, it's not reasonable to do the last thing, which is to charge uh, 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 those all of the costs of all of the national agricultural research systems and the CGR, which is the, the bottom uh, point two in the in the corner there. So, so this evidence, uh, I read this, we read this as saying that uh, this is consistent with the idea that uh, a conservative estimate is that the benefit cost ratio is on the order of eight or 10 to one. Another thing we can do in the same kind of spirit is to say, let's look at total productivity growth, uh, uh, total factor productivity growth using Keith Fugley's estimates and say, well, uh, what's that worth? How do we work that out? So we, we say, well, uh, in the world as a whole, TFP in 2016 was 217. Uh, it, was, it was 100 in 1961. Uh, and so it's grown by 117 relative to 100. If we went backwards, we'd forego that growth. Uh, what's that worth? We scale that proportional fall in productivity by going backwards by the value of agricultural production in 2016, 31, uh, uh, 3,185 billion. And so the total gains, therefore, would be uh, 1,690 billion attributable to productivity growth. We can do that kind of thing for every year from 1961 forward. Uh, and that gives us these numbers in the bottom right, which is 65,723 billion up to 2016, and more than that if we extend it out another 10 years. OK, so, so we can do that for every uh, one of these regions. And, and do this for the world as a whole or developing countries. I'm going to take this bottom line here, which is for the developing countries, and I'm going to compare that to some uh, some measures of cost. So we take those two numbers here and we say, well, let's compare that to the present value of costs. What we have, uh, our analysis from the meta-analysis suggested that uh, we could reasonably think that the, the benefit cost ratio for the NARS and the CG are uh, similar, so we'll just aggregate those costs together as almost all the NARS. And so we say one measure of cost is uh, using a 5% discount rate is from 1960 to 2015. Another measure is from 1960 to 2006. If we do 100% attribution of this growth to uh, uh, that expenditure, then we get benefit cost ratios that are shown in this uh, panel with columns one and two versus rows one and two. If we do 50% attribution, say 50% of that productivity growth is attributable to R&D, then we're in the right-hand panel. The off-diagonal ones are the ones that make the most sense, where we do costs from 1960 to 2015 against benefits for, for a period that extends out at least 10 years longer. Uh, or, and so, sorry, I went backwards. Uh, and so we're looking at these off-diagonal elements like column four and row one is 8.6, or column three and row two is 7.6. Uh, and if we do the 3% 3, 3 discount rate, we bump those numbers up to 13 and 11 instead. So, so these numbers are supportive of the idea that uh, productivity growth in uh, uh, developing countries, that which is uh, low income and middle income countries, productivity growth in those countries uh, uh, is valuable. If half of that's attributable to R&D, uh, uh, in the public sector and the CG, then the benefit cost ratio is plausibly in the range of uh, seven to 10 to 12 kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I hope I haven't uh, gone too long. I haven't been watching the clock as closely as I should. Uh, uh, I'm wrapping up. Uh, so wrapping it up. So one thing that we, we've learned here is that, that these, uh, the CG uh, has been studied a lot more intensively than, than uh, national agricultural research systems, 10 times as, uh, as intensively. So we had many, many more estimates of 
rates of return to CG spending than for, for, for the rest of the, the system. Uh, and, and it's also incongruous with respect to uh, uh, its commodity focus, it's almost all on crops. So it's so really strange. And, and this is true for the global evidence as well, I think Zhidong would tell you. Uh, and, uh, and in many cases, it's, we have this complicated attribution problem because so often it's the case where the CG is doing projects in some sense uh, jointly with a with, uh, national agricultural research system. So we've got those aspects when we start projecting outwards and saying, uh, uh, what do we think about future spending? We know a lot about returns to crop research and we know a lot about crop returns to research in the CG system compared with anywhere else. Uh, all of these estimates uh, in, in round terms, being sensible about things and realising that we, uh, we, we shouldn't be talking out to the fifth decimal place or even to the first one, that uh, the, the, on the order of 10 to 1 is a consistent theme from these different measures. It's a bit lower than, than the, the previous uh, rule of thumb, which was 17, uh, but I think we've been a, a bit more, uh, 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 in some senses, conservative in, in how we look at things. So uh, these things we can say that uh, 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 that this is uh, this research by the CG system is is research for the world's poor, uh, and it, it's it's been effective at that in the past. We see no evidence uh, uh, of diminishing returns to to this or any other agricultural research, uh, and uh, we see uh, uh, increasing uh, and stronger demands for research of this kind. Uh, looking forward for various reasons, including uh, uh, climate change and uh, shifts of uh, what the high income countries are doing. This is where I wish I were doing this. Uh, and um, uh, we have, uh, uh, these slides uh, will be available to everyone, I think, uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, but if anybody is interested in copies of any of these papers or whatever, please feel free to, to, to write to me. Uh, there's my email, or Phil, or, or as you don't and we'll give them to you. Uh, I think we've uh, reached a point where I can stop sharing and